Welcome back to the Law School Toolbox podcast. Today, we're excited to have ex-Big Law recruiter Sadie Jones here with us to talk about using winter break to get ready for the 1L job hunt. Your Law School Toolbox host today is Allison Monahan, and typically I'm with Lee Burgess. We're here to demystify the law school and early legal career experience so that you'll be the best law student and lawyer you can be. Together, we're the co-creators of the Law School Toolbox, the Bar Exam Toolbox, and the career-related website, Career Dicta. I also run the Girl's Guide to Law School. If you enjoy the show, please leave a review or rating on your favorite listening app. And if you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out to us. You can always reach us via the contact form on lawschooltoolbox.com, and we would love to hear from you. With that, let's get started. Welcome back to the Law School Toolbox podcast. Today, we're excited to have ex-Big Law recruiter Sadie Jones here with us to talk about using winter break to get ready for the 1L job hunt. Welcome, Sadie. Thanks for having me back. My pleasure. Well, if you had to pick one thing for 1Ls to do over the winter break to prepare for the summer job hunt, what would that be? I would say kind of the first thing, and if you you know only have time for one thing, is to get all of your application documents in order um, and make sure they're finalized because you want those ready to go when you get back. Um, so even if you aren't able to research jobs, I would say getting your resume, your cover letter, your writing sample, which should be around five pages your LinkedIn profile updated that you're looking for a job and you're in law school and, you know, that's all good. And then probably a reference list just to have that finalized. That'll probably be further in the process. Uh, You won't submit that with everything, but you might as well get that done. So to make sure all of those things are spotless, perfect, no typos, how you want them updated. Right. I think a LinkedIn is a great point because sometimes people don't think that that really needs to match that resume because, you know, you might not have thought about this for a while or whatnot. But I always think it's weird when you get a resume from someone and then you look at their LinkedIn and it's completely different. Like it just doesn't send a very good impression. Totally. And it should have a professional photo. And I don't mean that it has to be, you know, taken at a photo studio, but it should look professional. It shouldn't be like you cut out from a party, um, which <laughs> I have <not>. seen. <laughs> like people don't always even look like they're wearing clothes um, <laughs> with how like they cut it off. Here I am on a beach in Hawaii. Yeah. Like you can take a photo of yourself, you know, put on a button down shirt, um, you know, in front of like a blank background with an iPhone, which takes great pictures now. Yeah, true. That's fine. But it should be, you know, like a photo of your head. But I agree, it should be updated. That's the first place that people, you know, are going to look for you online. And it's something, you know, you can use to network and for so many different things. And I've actually talked to a few 1Ls recently who didn't even know what LinkedIn was, which surprised me or had never even thought to do one. And it may be more people go straight through, you know, haven't used it before. But regardless, you know, you just need to have it and it just needs to, you know, be done correctly and it doesn't need to be overly complicated, Uh, but it should have everything you've done. And, you know, it's a great tool. It is. I mean, what do you think? Do you think people should spend time trying to get referrals and references and things like that that you see sometimes? You know, I think it's okay to have like one or two. They don't, to me, they don't mean that much. Um, Like, it's not like I'm going to go in as the employer and like read through what like your old boss slash friend said about you. (laughs) Um, I guess it's nice if you see, oh, okay, they have a few people. I would spend way more time on, you know, who's in your network and connecting with people and trying to, you know, find people than I would too much about like sort of the little extra things that they do. Yeah, and I think as Twitter kind of declines, more and more people are actually starting to post content and kind of try to network on LinkedIn and stuff um, professionally. So, you know, this could be an interesting time to get in on the ground floor of your profile there. I agree. I've gotten way more updates recently, you know, that someone posted an article or said something versus I think in the past it was like they prompt you, oh, this person's having like a work anniversary right. or something. You get like, oh, they great. I get a bunch of automated emails being like, congratulations on your work anniversary. I'm like, oh, did I have a work anniversary? You know? You're like, I picked a random day. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so, so yeah, I think there is more content. And I agree with you. I think Twitter was used 
out of all the social media maybe with more professional stuff in the past and that that's changing so i think it's great you know to have this updated and you know use it the best way you can right and with regard to the writing sample i mean at this point if you're a first semester 1l that's pretty much going to have to be what you did for legal writing it probably is i mean unless yeah, I can't really think of where else you would have something um, unless you'd done some kind of previous work that, you know, was legal related, but you haven't had a legal job yet. Um, and that's totally fine. I think we've talked about it before. There's a high chance that no one will ever read it. If I'm being <laughs> totally honest, I've rarely seen them read, but that doesn't mean that it shouldn't be correct. It doesn't mean that you don't need one if they require it. So I think it's sort of one of those things like you have to check the box and, you know, someone may never see it, but it should be sort of the best, you know, that it can be and fit the criteria. And I really think my number one advice is that it needs to be short. Yeah. Um, and people don't always believe me or listen to me about this, but I promise you they they won't read it if it's too long. And if they need to read it, they're going to be kind of annoyed. Yeah, I completely agree. And also it just gives you more opportunity to make mistakes and things like that. So if you have a longer document, I would suggest just cutting out, you know, one section that you think is the strongest section. And then you can just have a little introduction that says like, you know, this is a piece of a longer brief that address blah, blah, blah. But I'm just giving you, you know, this two page or three page or whatever it is argument. Um, and that can help, you know, if maybe you didn't do so well in legal writing, you're not happy overall with the piece, but there's one part of it that, you know, your professor said wasn't too bad. Maybe you can work with that. I totally agree. And I think people get really bogged down with that idea of how to cut it down. Like in their minds, it doesn't make sense if it's just one section or there's no way to just cut out the last five pages or something. But I totally agree with you. You can just explain that it's a section. That's fine. They don't need to know like your full legal argument. Like, no they cares. don't care. <laughs> like it doesn't matter. But I have found that people get really bogged down with this idea when I tell them like just cut out five pages from it, you know, take that section. And they're like, I don't know how to do that. Yeah. It's literally like just use copy and paste. <laughs> yeah, it's fine. Like they can understand whatever that five pages is. Yeah, they're um, literally just looking for like, you know, can you structure some sort of coherent argument? Like, do you know what a rule is? Do you understand citations? Are your citations clean? Like that's the sort of thing they're looking for. They're not looking for like, oh my gosh, this is the most amazing legal analysis of this completely constructed topic that I've ever seen in my life. Absolutely. Are there no typos? <laughs> Right. Is it is it a clean document? Does the so formatting look good? It doesn't need to be amazing writing and some new idea. It just needs to be, you know, clean and concise and make sense, you know, and be sort of fine. Right, because they're trying to answer the question of if I gave this person a very basic research task and asked them to produce something in writing, could they possibly do that? Exactly. I totally agree. All right. Well, beyond getting your application details or, you know, sort of documents in order. What else can people do over the winter break? Well, I think, you know, there's some things you can do, particularly if you're going to be in a different location than where your school is, and that location is where you want to work. So this is a great opportunity to network in the location you want to be. And obviously, this isn't everyone, but I would say this is a good percentage of people, you know, who are in school somewhere else, but they're from, you know, a different Place and that's where they'll be over the holidays. Or maybe you're visiting a place you want to live or you want to work. Um, you know, maybe this, this is an opportunity to spend time there and try to network. So I think like that's first to me. If there's a way to use the location, you'll be to, you know, talk to people. Um, obviously, you'll be around friends and family. So let everyone you know know that you're looking for a job, not in an obnoxious way, but in a way, you know, that you're just using the fact that you're there and you're catching up with people to let them know, like, you never know who might have something. I think people just make this kind of assumption that, you know, they're, let's say, not lawyers uh, who they're seeing. So therefore, how could they help them? And I just don't think that's true at all. Oh, I agree. So you should capitalize on it. Yeah, because you don't know who people know. You don't know who people work with. Um, you know, most people who are 
working in sort of professional environments know a lot of people and they may just have ideas for you too. And like some of those ideas may be terrible and you shouldn't listen to them, but some of them might not be. Exactly. You can, you know, take what you want and sort of leave the rest. I mean, there could be random neighbors. I've heard stories like that. You know, there's a judge that lives down the street or something. Like, right. You never know. So I feel like there's no harm in just letting anyone that, you know, you're already going to be connecting with know. And then also, you know, do some work to figure out, is there anything going on in the location? Is there an event? Is there a local bar association? Um, you know, is there some kind of alumni event from your undergrad and you're going to be in that location? Uh, there's so many different things I can think of where there might be an opportunity to like go to something to attend a holiday party, a training, like all sorts of things, uh, like use this time. Yeah, I think you could even consider doing some informational interviews if there are like people in your network that you're interested in learning more from. And, you know, again, like this may not lead directly to a job offer, but it might. I mean, when I was in my first grad school, I went and talked to like my friend's mother who was an architect and like she wasn't hiring, but her friend was. So great. I suddenly had a summer job. No problem. You know, you just don't really know. Or maybe it leads to a 2L job. Maybe it's not this summer, but it's next summer. So kind of you know, keep a list of who you, you know, kept in touch with or, you know, who could be a mentor, you know. So I would say don't be singularly focused on only the 1L job, even though that's, you know, what you need right now. You never know. So use this opportunity to network sort of widely and, you know, see what comes with it. Yeah, I think your old professors from undergrad can be a great resource, like people that you worked closely with, like if you did a thesis, that kind of thing. You know, you might think these people forget about you the second you leave, but they don't really. I mean, I've had professors like my thesis advisor. I had met him for coffee like many years after I graduated because he emailed me and was like, oh, I think you're in Boston. I think I was clerking at the time. You know, this was like a long time after undergrad. And he was really excited to sit down and like tell me what they'd been doing since, you know, I left many years ago. So that doesn't even have to be somebody that you do in person. You know, maybe you just have like a check in, like a you know virtual coffee date or something with an old professor. But all these people actually... You know, they're kind of invested in you and they probably would be happy to hear that, you know, you're in law school. Like, how's it going? What are you thinking about it? All these things. Totally. I think they take pride in like you doing well. And right. And they want to help you. Things. Yeah. I think that people are too quick to just assume that you're sort of a burden or going to be annoying or, you know, there's nothing they can do for you. And I don't think that's true. I think most people do want to help you if you're, you know, polite and you know and nice about it and appreciative I think like you know you'll get a lot out of it yeah and that's a good point that it doesn't have to be in person so this might be just a chance where you have some extra time right so these could be virtual too like use that time yeah and I think just making a list of even if it's people that you want to contact like you know in your law school area when you're back in school you know all of these things I think this is a great time to really sit down, kind of think about your plan, think about the things you want to be doing to move this forward. Um, I mean, it seems like you also probably want to think about where you want to apply during this time. Do you agree with that? Definitely. I think that especially in the 1L search um, where this is your, you know, first look at what kind of legal jobs there are, you know, and maybe you're new to all of this, you don't even know like where you should be looking, what you should be looking at. So I think it's a great time to just like make up a big list, you know, some of them may be, you know, out of reach or not the right thing, but like make a list. You can always run it by people or do some research. I would say like start, you know, as big as possible and sort of narrow it down. Um, And you can sort of have like tier one, tier two, you know, kind of jobs you'd be looking at too. But I would make the list organized like, you know, I like Excel for this. Um, where you can kind of have columns and sort. And so you can have like the job, the location, where you apply, you could spend some time, you know, everything's pretty much an online application, right? You know, at this point or usually. So, you know, where you're going to do all that, what they require for their application, like put some time into making a really nice list. Yeah, you can have different tabs if you're thinking like maybe you're going to apply for an externship with a judge. Okay, where are the judges? Who are you listing them? You know, where, who are these people? If you're going to apply for like public interest work, if you're going to apply for like law firm jobs, like I can see keeping all that stuff really organized would definitely, definitely help. 
and you know if it's big you can kind of you know start with you know your number one choices and kind of go from there and with you know excel and things like that you can sort of um you know use it really really nicely and also the list can include people you may know at those jobs and you can kind of incorporate the networking into the list you know or or if somebody suggests something you can add it to that so i think it's a great way to kind of keep the jobs and the people that maybe can help you in the same place where do you think people should be looking for kind of these big buckets? Like, where do you get information about what jobs are out there? Well, I think in terms of, you know, 1Ls, like you should start with your school because there are a lot of resources with career services for 1Ls. Usually there's sort of certain jobs that are for 1Ls um, and they're not going to be jobs where you get a permanent job offer. So they're sort of different than the, the 2L bucket. Um, And a lot of them are going to be unpaid, you know, not all of them. Uh, So I would say, like, start with career services in terms of if they know specifically, you know, jobs that may fit you. But a lot of 1Ls are going to work for judges and all of that generally is going to be online, you know. So you look up, like, the location, what courts, you know, what different judges are hiring 1Ls. So that's like always a good area, I think. Um, and then obviously, you know, there are people who are going to apply to law firms, as we've said in the past. It's very unlikely that you're going to get a law firm job, especially in big laws of 1L. But you can certainly look um, on NALP or some of the other, you know, ways to research law firms in terms of if they say they're hiring 1Ls. Um, also go to their websites. But I generally think that you should go individually to the places you're looking and look at their website versus I don't think these sort of mass job sites work as well for these kind of legal jobs. Yeah, I think that's probably true. I mean, you know, like Indeed and things like that are popular, but um, I think starting with your school and like asking them, you know, where do I find this stuff if they haven't already given you that information is a great place to start because it is a very kind of niche area and you don't want to waste a ton of time just like looking at jobs where this is not exactly what they're hiring for. Mm-hmm. And I will say that, you know, there is a job for every 1L. I really feel that. Um, you know, if the 1L didn't get a job, usually it's because they either didn't take one or somehow weren't like part of the process. Like the school is really make sure that 1Ls have jobs. Right. Um, and because a lot of them are unpaid, they're sort of easier to slot in, I think. Um, and there's just like set spots like this is, you know, an internship for a 1L. So to me, that would make me feel better as a 1L. Like there is a place for me. I personally feel really confident about that. Yeah. So I think let's talk a little bit more about using the law school's resources. What are some things you think people should be looking at or doing in terms of what their law school offers? Well, one is to get to know your career services. And I think some people sort of miss the boat on that and don't realize that there's, you know, a whole department at your law school whose job it is to make sure you have a job. And, you know, I hear lots of feedback that some people do or do not like their career services. I understand. And they're people. So, like, you know, you don't necessarily connect with everyone. But I do think it's important to at least start there. And so to make an appointment with them, to go in person and meet them, I think is important. So if you haven't done that yet, I would set that up for January when you get back from break. Um, And I'm sure you can email them or, you know, there's a portal or something. So I would do that first. Make sure they know who you are. They know what you're looking for. um, You know, you're kind of top of mind if something comes up because really like their job is to help you. So that's definitely like the first place I would go at your school. I agree. I think most people underutilize career services and like they're not all amazing. But typically most people got into this because they do want to help you. So I think if you go in with an attitude and try to build a relationship, um, you know, you're likely to get some like decent advice. I agree. And then another place that's great is sort of like alumni resources. So... Also, this may be from your undergrad. Um, So even if you're at law school at a different place, like there may be things that you can use as alumni of the other school to look for legal jobs. I think some people don't even realize that. But like your undergrad still wants you to succeed in the future. Right. You're still part of it. And certain, you know, depending 
on the school, they may have like a very strong alumni network. I mean, there are certain schools are just known for that. So most likely there are people from your undergrad who went to law school and are now lawyers, lots of those people. So even if you're doing some informational interviews, um, you know, that's the sort of thing that can kind of get you a leg up. Or sometimes they have job listings, True. you know, or a site and you need, you know, most people have an alumni email or their old school email that they need to log in. I remember using that years after I graduated undergrad. True. And I was surprised at how few people even, you know, realize because um, they've sort of moved on. So that's, you know, a possibility. No, that's a good point. I mean, I get emails that I ignore all the time from schools that I've gone to being like, would you like to join our, you know, alumni, whatever LinkedIn group? And I'm like, mm, no. But, you know, if I were looking for work, I probably would. I think some people just assume this is all about, you know, them trying to get money from you, which it may be, but you can still use it in whatever way you want. You don't necessarily have to give them money. No, exactly. And I mean, I think they do, again, like they do try to be helpful because they want you to have a nice feeling about how helpful your previous school was to you in your time of need. And then maybe you'll donate later. Yeah, absolutely. (laughs) And I do think it's nice to sort of pay it forward, Um, you know, whether it's money or or just like helping people. Yeah. And I think there also can be alumni from your law school that are working somewhere where you want to work and you can reach out and make that connection for them. You know, I'm currently a 1L at X law school that you, you know, I see graduated from and I'd love to talk to you and try to get an informational interview that way. Yeah, definitely. Um, I think another kind of underutilized resource can be affinity groups, either at your law school or again, like maybe sort of like undergrad alumni. I mean, if you were in the Greek system, like those people, you know, at least think they help you throughout your life. So I think just like kind of casting a broad net here and really thinking about, you know, what connections do I have that I can kind of leverage here that I might not be thinking about can be really helpful. Totally. And it might be something that you, you don't even have to have been super involved in it. You know, I think like it could be something you did for whatever, a brief amount of time, but you can still utilize the group. And like if you were involved, you're, you know, an alumni of it. So I totally agree. I think you should go back and really think about everything you've done and make a list and and think about how you can use um, possible connections from those things. And it doesn't have to be law related. Right. And if you are in affinity groups at your law school, you know, you're in the Women's Law Association, if they don't have something set up on finding a 1L job, like ask people, be like, hey, I'd really love to get input from like successful 2 and 3Ls about what they did to find a 1L summer job. Could we have a little panel on that or whatever? Or even just a, you know, coffee break and chat sort of thing. I mean, people are usually pretty willing to do things like that. And then maybe you've like taken on a project and you have a leadership role in the group. Exactly. <laughs> so you don't put that on your resume. <laughs> yeah. And I think you should join those groups. I think that I totally get that there's a big transition, you know, 1L year and people obviously need to be focused on their classes. But don't forget about these things, which don't have to be a huge time commitment, but I think can be beneficial. Oh, there, there's, I mean, ideally they're there to help you with whatever it is that you need. So if you need something, just ask for it. I mean, maybe they say, oh, no, we're too busy. But I mean, I think generally speaking, you know, people who've, who've agreed to join this group and run this group want to do programming and they're looking for ideas. And this would be a pretty easy thing to set up. Absolutely. And I will say, if I look at someone's resume and they have zero anything on it, you know, it just says law school, you do kind of think like, okay, so they were involved in absolutely nothing on campus. Um, yeah. And that, you know, so that's something to think about now, too. I was. I think particularly in the 1L search, because a lot of places are looking for kind of ambassadors in this, mm-hmm. particularly law firms. So you they are looking for that person who's going to be involved, like be social, be a good ambassador, talk to 2Ls, you know, next year about what a great experience they had. Like that's the person that a lot of these places are really looking for. Definitely. That's how you get those kind of jobs. Yeah. You got to be a cheerleader, basically. Yeah. So, you know, obviously your grades matter and all of that, but it's sort of a different criteria as a 1L. Right. Because if you're looking between two people with similar grades and one of them is already involved in like four different activities and doing pro bono work, you're like, oh, okay, this person A is capable of balancing all of this and still getting good grades. And B, like, obviously is out there, like doing things, being sociable, like maybe we want that person. Because basically, like a law firm who's hiring a 1L, 
like knows that they're going to have an opportunity to go somewhere else as a 2L and most likely will go to that firm. So they're not necessarily looking at it as a future hire. They're looking at it as somebody who can like spread the word about this firm on campus, yeah. particularly somewhere maybe they've had trouble recruiting. So think about that. Yeah, but that's pretty specific. Th- yeah, that is specific. But I would say, you know, you're hiring a 1L, you know they're going to be at school for a few more years. So you generally do want, you know, people that you feel like are going to say they had a good experience. Yeah, and people don't expect you to be like involved in 10 different things, but I do think if you can find one or two things to join and put on your resume, that's usually just a good sign. And it also can give kind of an indication of your interests. Um, you know, if you're applying for a particular type of job and it is an area that you're interested in, join whatever club relates to that. You know, it's fine. Totally. And I actually think you don't want to overdo it because that kind of sends this message right. that it's over the top. Ten different things. Because <laughs> I see that too. But having it be blank to me does stand out. Yeah. I mean, nobody expects a lot from you right now, but just like kind of think about how you could craft your materials to be on point for the job you're applying for. Exactly. I agree. And, you know, if you're applying for public interest, you may not want like all of your previous like work for, you know, all these corporate companies and things to be the first thing on your resume. It's not that you take it off. It's that you emphasize different things. So, you know, you probably do want to be doing some like pro bono work or something that you can put front and center on your resume. And then like the opposite of that, if you're looking to go into the corporate world. With no background. (laughs) Yeah. You probably don't want to, you know, everything in your background to be public interest volunteer. Yeah. (laughs) Like, so think about that. Because I think, um, you know, it's different than when you've been looking at applying to schools, let's say, in terms of what your sort of activities are. So just think about how it, what story it tells. Right. And you might want separate resumes and things for different types of jobs. And that is 100% fine. You're not lying. You're just crafting your story differently. Exactly. I mean, it's just marketing. Right. Exactly. So think about how to tell the story for this particular job. You don't have to include like every job you've ever had in your entire life going back to high school. You know, this is a professional resume, so just kind of think of it in that way. You probably want to get some feedback on it and make sure that it's telling the story you want to tell. Definitely. I agree. All right. Well, we are running a little short on time, but let's talk about the timing on this particular project. I mean, if people are listening to this in mid-December, are they behind the ball already? I would say definitely not. You're sort of in a sweet spot, which is applications have just opened. So let's say you haven't done anything and you're listening to this, you know, to get everything going. Great. This is a great time to start. You are not behind. You can do some work over break and be ready to go in January, right? I think the issue comes when people just really want to do nothing over break, which I understand, and just kind of zone out of it. And then you get back in January and you're busy with school you know, and sort of get acclimated and then it's February and then you're getting everything started, then you're behind the ball. So, you know, the idea is put in some work where you have some extra time so that there's not going to be pressure. Um, And I would say the sooner that you get a job and get that out of the way, the more you can focus on your schoolwork or maybe, you know, other extracurriculars you're going to get started. Um, So having the job search hang over your head, you know, until the spring, you can do it. There are still jobs to be had, but it's going to be this thing that you're constantly having to do in the background. And so it's great, you know, to plan to have this like, you know, done by February. I think that should kind of be the goal. So this is like a great time, but I think it is easy to get behind if you sort of keep telling yourself that, oh, you know, I have time. Like, I don't really need to worry about this until the spring. Right. And the reality is a lot of places won't hire until you have all of your grades. And I think some people use that as an excuse. But the reality is you want your application sitting there. And then when you have grades, you send them over versus like, oh, I got my grades. Now I can figure out where to start applying. Exactly. I mean, I think it's just like do whatever you can do so that that part of the process is done, even if, you know, it's not going to be complete until you sort of get back to school. Just like get a head start. Yeah, I agree. Well, before we wrap up, let's talk briefly about how people can find opportunities either at their law school or say other local events like career fairs, because I know that this is not necessarily a generation of students who necessarily communicate in the ways that schools and other organizations do. So let's talk a little bit about that. 
Well, I would say, first of all, make sure that you are checking your inbox, that you don't have thousands of unread emails <laughs> that you're not paying attention to or things are going to spam. Check that because I think like you're probably on lists through your school. And so you may miss those um, or you may sort of think of it as just kind of junk mail um, or you're used to, you know, sort of ignoring things. But this is the time where you don't want to be ignoring things. You want to be like finding out about events. Um, you know, some of them might be virtual. So one, like check the things you're probably already getting and pay attention to them. And I would say, you know, check with the career services, see if there's mailing lists you should be on, see if there's anything that you need to sign up for, see if any, you know, law firms are having like free 1L events or, you know, a panel or something like that. I also think, you know, we talked about LinkedIn. There are different like groups on LinkedIn. There's different ways to network there, other social media, um, you know, it may not be like your normal social media that you follow for fun, but there may be, you know, accounts that you should follow that are focused on 1L events or junior lawyers or a lot of bar associations have different groups and there may be just like law student groups. Um, so look at those for like the local area. So, you know, sort of think outside the box and what you normally, you know, do online. Yeah, I think the key here is like you actually have to open all these emails that people are sending to you because they may actually have opportunities to do things and to meet people and even for jobs and whatever your school system is. Just understand the system and like check in regularly, see what's there because you're gonna have to be pretty proactive on this probably. Yeah, it's not just gonna, you know, fall in your lap. So right. like I said, there are one L jobs for everyone. You still have to do work to get it. <laughs> exactly. You gotta go out and find that job. It's not just gonna probably like yeah. land in your lap. And I want you to get the best job you can, the one that, you know, kind of fits your needs the best. So you're most likely to get that one by, you know, putting more work into it now. Yeah, you got to hustle a little bit, basically, yeah. or you're going to end up at the end being like, oh, gosh, I just have to take whatever comes my way because I didn't devote the time and energy to this previously. And I guarantee you, you will regret that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Is that your final thought or you have any other final thoughts? <laughs> so my final thought is that I do think it's really easy to kind of get to break and like before you know it, you know, three or four weeks have gone by and it's over. And I totally get that people, you know, want to binge Netflix and catch up with their old friends and stuff. So what I like to suggest is to set a time aside on your calendar where you've looked at this maybe before you go on break and you say, like, I'm going to do job stuff during these windows. Um, or on the other hand, you could set aside time where you're like, I'm totally going to veg out, you know, for these days or whatever. So I just like that as a suggestion to actually put it on your calendar because getting those reminders pop up sometimes does make you say like, okay, like I'm supposed to do this now. Um, and I just think that you will regret, you know, having the whole break gone by and then you have to do all of this when you get back to school. So I really think like use some of this time to, you know, focus on the one all job search. I agree. You shouldn't kill yourself over it. But any time spent now is going to be time you don't have to spend later when you're more stressed out and you're trying to learn about like property law as well. So just block out some time, like get some balls rolling. And I think you're going to set yourself up for a much better position later on. Yes, you will thank us. You will. <laughs> Send us an email. Tell us what a great job you got. We'll be happy. Well, with that, unfortunately, we are out of time. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. My pleasure. For more career help and the opportunity to work one-on-one -on -one with us, including on your summer job, check out careerdicta.com. If you enjoyed this episode of the Law School Toolbox podcast, please take a second to leave a review or rating on your favorite listening app. We would really appreciate it. And be sure to subscribe so you don't miss anything. If you have any questions or comments, please don't hesitate to reach out to Lee or Allison at lee at lawschooltoolbox.com or allison at lawschooltoolbox.com. Or you can always contact us via our website contact form at lawschooltoolbox.com. Thanks for listening and we'll talk soon. Good luck getting a job.